you've gone through, if you stuck with me the whole video, you've coded up 140 some lines of Swift code. Hi everyone, my name's John and welcome to Swift Basics. I wanna help you learn how to build iOS apps, but before we can do that, we need to learn a little bit about a programming language that is used to actually make those apps called Swift. So if you're ready, let's go ahead and get started. First things first, you're gonna need what's known as an integrated developer development environment to actually start running code. So the typical one that's used for iOS apps is called Xcode. So if you don't have Xcode installed already, simply open up your app store and search for Xcode. You should see it'll be this developer tools option uh, has the hammer. And since I already have it, it just says open. But for you, if it's new to you, it will be a get or a download. Now Xcode is going to take a little while to actually install. But once you have that done, go ahead and open it up. Now you're going to have this window that pops up that says welcome to Xcode. So you get the views of create a new project, clone an existing, open a project or file. We're not gonna do any of that today. Instead, we're gonna go up to File, go to New, and you're gonna see this option called Playground. If you select Playground, you'll get this window that shows blank game map single view. We're gonna go with a blank Playground. And you can call this whatever you want. So I'm just gonna leave it at the default of my Playground. But be sure you can put it in a place where you're going to remember where it is. Uh, easiest is just on your desktop. So I already had one called My Playground, so I had to replace it on the desktop. But once that's done, this is the window you're going to have. So you can see, pretty simple. Um, you've got the name of the file, sources, resources. Don't worry about that. To actually hide it away, you can hit your command button and the number key zero. And now you get a full space to actually work with the playground. And you can see there's this default code that gets added for you. Let me just make this a little bigger so it's easier for you to see. But now you can see this var greeting hello playground. So when you click this little button, this is the run button, you'll actually see that when this processes, it'll actually print out to the side what you've written there, Hello Playground. So playgrounds are a great way for you to test new functionality or try something that you haven't done before in Swift. So let's go ahead and get started. And the very first thing I wanna talk about is um, what are constants and what are variables? So these are basic building blocks of coding that allow you to store information. So in Swift, you can declare a variable using the var keyword, and variables are gonna let you change the value that you put in them later on. So for example, if I use, let me go ahead and look here. If I use var my age, notice how I've typed this out. This is known as camel case, which is kind of the accepted convention for Swift programming var my age equals four. Say I'm four years old, right? So this is how I'm actually going to store what's known as an integer, the number four, in my variable my age. Now the cool thing about variables is you can actually change this around. So obviously this was a mistake, right? My age isn't really four. Let's say I'm actually 27. So when you do that, you can actually see that this will change and update. So to verify that, we're gonna use something called a print statement. So print, if you start typing it out, this allows you to print values to your console. So if you print my age, you can start to see what we have as autocomplete. So Xcode is smart enough to know to help you out when you're looking for variable names. You can print my age, and when we hit the run button, we'll actually see down here that it printed out 27. Pretty cool, right? So I mentioned the other type you can have, which is a constant. So things that aren't gonna change, you don't want that changing. So typically, say for example, your name isn't usually gonna change. 
So let my name equals John, right? That is a constant value. And here we're declaring something called a string. So a string is a way to capture text information in Swift. So you simply declare it using the double quote. Anything that you put in between that is going to be uh, the value that gets stored in that constant. So just to kind of show you that I'm not lying about constants not being changeable, if we had my name, we try to set it to something else, say Billy, Xcode is going to get mad at us. You know, it's going to pop up an error. It says cannot assign value. My name is a let constant. So Xcode is smart. It gives you the option to actually fix this. So if I did want to change my name, I can do change let to var to make it mutable. Mutable simply meaning you can change it. Now, I don't want to do that. So I'm just going to get rid of this line completely and ignore that I ever wanted to change my name to Billy. So we've been looking at so far integers and strings, but there are a number of other things that we can use in Xcode um, and Swift that are different data types as they're referred to. So examples, you can have doubles, which are another way of storing a number, but it isn't a perfect integer. So let's say let calories burned. So you have a really great uh, calorie tracker and it's able to track fractions of a number. You can see you did 432 and a half calories so far today. Now, if you were to try and use this as an integer, this is another way you can let Xcode know what kind of value you want. So before you set it equal to something, you can actually specify that I want calories burned to only be a type of int. Now, if I do that, Xcode's gonna complain again. And the reason for that is we can't convert the value of type double to the specified type int. So if we wanted to fix that, a couple of ways we could do it, can simply remove the fractional part, or if we did wanna keep it as a double, we simply declare this as double. Now we have literally specified how we want this value or the value that this is going to accept. So of type double. The next thing I want to look at is what's known as Booleans. So Booleans are a very simple yes or a no. It's either a one, it's a zero. So how Booleans work is very simply, you declare, like we've been doing, uh, let is true, declare your constant or a variable, but then you give it a value of either true or you give it a value of false. We're gonna see this come into play a little bit later in the video when we start talking about if statements, where we're gonna have conditions that if something is true, perform some kind of action, but wanted to give you kind of a heads up before we get to that spot. There's also a number of other data types. I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, I'll have links in the description for where you can read more about Swift, but there are things like, we've talked about strings, we have doubles, we have ints. There's also some more advanced kind of data types that work as collections of data, and we'll use this a little later, but be on the lookout, we're gonna have things like arrays and dictionaries. So we can kind of store multiple pieces of information all in one variable versus having to create multiple variables for things. So the next thing I wanna talk about is classes and structs. So what are classes and what are structs? Well, a class is a reference type that Swift allows you to use to kind of group pieces of functionality. Structs are very similar, except the only difference is they're what's known as a value type. I'll get into this a little more later in the video, but I'm gonna show you now how you can actually create those to kind of group certain pieces of functionality. So as you can see, we've already done something with my age, my name, 
Um, maybe it'd be kind of nice to have like a person class. So how you create that is you use the word class and then you specify what you actually want. So in this case, I'll do a person class. Open and close with the curly brackets. And now in here, you can start to give properties that belong to this class person. So for our example, we're going to use name, which will be of a type string. We will use birth month, which is also going to be a string. And lastly, we're going to use an age. Now this one, we're going to make it variable. It says your age is going to change each year, right? So with that, we now have our basic class. But what you can see now is Xcode is, you know, complaining at us again. What's the problem? It says class person has no initializer. So what does that mean? Basically, when classes are created, Xcode needs a way of understanding where data is actually going to go. So we need to initialize it. And the way we do that is through the init declaration. And you can see if you hit enter on that, you'll get the autofill for parameters and statements. So here we're just specifying what do we actually need person to fill in when we are creating a new instance of person. So in our case, we need the name, which is again a string, the birth month, string, and lastly, the age, integer. Next, we are gonna tell Xcode that we want the name equal to the name that we specify when we create an instance of the class, the birth month to be equal to the birth month that we give, and lastly, same thing for age. So now that we have our basic class set up, let's actually use it, right? Let's create a new instance of the person class. So I'm gonna do let John equal person, capital, you can see, and an open parenthesis. Now you can see this autocomplete here where you're getting the name, the birth month, and the age, the properties that we specified when we were making our class. So here I'm just gonna fill in, my name's John, born in October, shout out to the October babies, and then my age, 27. So what have we done? We have now created an instance of the person class. So if I want to print out John, I can now use the dot syntax to access the different properties of John. So here we can have age, birth month, and name. So let's say we want to use the age. We want to actually print out how old I am we can see we get a 27 printed out. Next, like I mentioned, we declared age as a variable. We can actually change it. So if we want to set this to something new, we can do john.age. Say I've now grown a few years in the past few seconds, and I'm now 30. Now if we print this out again, we can see that I am now 30. I have changed my age. So this is the basics of what a class is. But what is a struct? How is that different? So very similar to creating a class, creating a struct, you simply create it with the keyword struct, and then you name it what you want. Not to get it confused with the other person, I'm going to call this struct new person. Similar to our person class, we are going to use the same uh, properties. We're going to use let name be of type string, let birth month be of type string, and a variable age of int. Now notice something here. We're not getting an error. Interesting, right? So before we were getting the errors with classes, you have to actually specify the initializer you want to use. But with structures, Xcode does that for you. So with a struct, it creates that initializer 
behind the scenes for us. But when we actually go to use it, it's very similar. So let's say we're gonna create another new person, Bob, but this time it's new person. So we have the name, Bob. Let's say Bob was born in February. And let's say Bob is 33. Now when we print out Bob, we're just gonna print out his name. We can see that it's basically the same, right? That's what it may look like. However, if you remember back to what I said right before getting into coding these things, structs are a value type and classes are a reference type. So what does that actually mean? What that means is when you're creating a class, you're passing something by a reference. So multiple objects that are created are gonna point to that same reference. So let me give you an example. Let's say we come back up here, we have John. Let's say we wanna create another person with the class. So we can say let Jim equal John, right? So now, in theory, this should be an exact copy, right? So if we go ahead and print out Jim.name and we run this, we can see that we're getting John printed out. But what happens if we actually try to change certain properties? Is that gonna mess anything up between the two? So we can do the adjustment of the age, gym.age, and we'll set that to 44. Now if we print out Jim's age, we can see that it's 44. But what do you think happened to John? Is John's age still 27? It's not. So what you can see here is an example of it being passed as a reference. It's referring to basically the same object to where if you change it in one place, it updates everywhere. So the advantage of using a struct is if you actually wanna have two different people, you're gonna have two different instances of it. So we'll have let Carl equal Bob. And now very similar to what we did before, we wanna do carl.age equal 18, and we'll print out Carl's age, and we'll print out Bob's age. Well, it helps if we create a variable Carl. So now we can actually change the properties that we want to change. So now when we print it out, now you can see these are two different instances. These are value types. So now we have a separate age for Carl and a separate age for Bob. The way I've heard this kind of described that kind of helped me understand the difference between structs and classes was think of them as a Google Sheet versus an Excel doc. So if you are gonna be using a Google Sheet on a team, that's like a class, right? If you share out the link and people start making changes, that's gonna be changed everywhere. So even though you yourself may have not made a change, if someone else did, that's gonna update your Google Sheet. Whereas structs are more like the Excel doc. You can send that Excel off to anyone. They can make as many changes as they want, and it doesn't really matter what changes they made because yours isn't gonna be affected. They only made changes to their copy. So hopefully that helps. Hopefully it makes it a little easier to understand the difference between the two. Um, but those are structs and classes. Now you may be wondering, you know, when's a good time to use a struct? When's a good time to use a class? Well, one good example of when to use a class is when you actually need something to inherit. So there's this topic of inheritance in programming, and that can only be done with classes. So what am I talking about? Let's look at an example. If we do a class vehicle, and we wanna say 
its properties are going to be color and the engine, both strings. We are going to initialize it with the color and the engine. And we've just now created our vehicle class. Well, as I'm sure people know, there are many different types of vehicles, right? So one example is a car. A car still has a color and an engine, but there are certain things that are specific to cars, like number of wheels, for example. So we can create another class called car that inherits from vehicle. So you can see this syntax here. When I put the colon after car and add vehicle, I am now saying car is going to inherit everything from vehicle, but I now want to do some of my own things with that. So let's say number of wheels, and we're going to make that equal to four. Right? So now we can create an instance of the car. And notice something when I go to initialize this. So you can see color and engine. I never specified color or engine in my car class. However, it's inheriting what it's getting from the vehicle class. So when I select this, I can now specify I'm going to have a green car with a V8. And now when I go to print it out, I can see car dot color. And you may have already seen it, you may have caught it, but what else is there? The number of wheels property. So notice I didn't specify that when I was actually creating the instance because I gave it a default value of four. So it assumes that four is going to be the number of wheels when you create any kind of car instances. So if I add number of wheels here, we can print this out and we can see exactly what we expected, right? So we're going to have a green car with four wheels. Pretty cool, right? So inheritance, it's important to remember that you cannot use inheritance with structs. This is something that's specifically used with vehicles. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is functions. So functions are a way for you to group similar pieces of code together. Excuse me, not similar pieces of code, a certain group of functionality that you want to put together that maybe you kind of use in more than one place. So how do we use functions? How do we declare functions? Well, we're actually going to do this in our car class. We want to make a function within our car class. So we can declare a function within our car class called honk the horn. And we simply want this to just print out beep beep. Simple as that. That is your basic function declaration. You use the keyword func, give your function a name. And for the moment, we have these open close parentheses. We'll talk a little bit about this more later in the video. And then open and close curly brackets. And then a print statement. So obviously, you can do more than just print things in a function, but that's what we're using for this example. So how do we actually call this? Well, now we can do car, use our dot syntax, and you can see the first one we get on corn. So now when we run this, Xcode is going to execute the functionality we we're looking for when we created our honk horn method, which was print out beep beep. And as you can see in the console, that is what we got. Now, what I've just shown you is a pretty basic way that you can use functions. We're not taking in any parameters, as they're called, and we're not really returning anything. So one thing I want to show you is how do we actually take in parameters for a function, and how do we return something back? So here we're going to create a new function, and we're going to call this calculate the product. 
So this is a basic function where we're going to take in two parameters. We're going to have an A and a B. So A will make that of type double, and B will also be of type double. And lastly, we want to return an answer when we actually use this function. So the way we do that in Swift is with the dash, the caret, and then specify what you actually want to return. So we're taking in two doubles, and we want to return a double. Open and close brackets. And now we're actually going to return what we want to do. So we use the keyword return. And in this case, since we're doing a product, it's simply A times B. Pretty cool, right? Pretty simple. So now we can actually call this function. We can use calculate product. And you can see the different parameters that we specified. We need an A and we need a B. So let's say 4.3 and 5.5. .5. That's what we want to do. And notice, right now if we run this, we'll get this in the side where we actually have 2365, but we're not really storing that value or doing anything with it. So what you can do when you return something from a function is you can actually capture the result. So if you want to say let result equal calculate product, now we're actually capturing result and we can use it later. So something as simple as just printing out the result. We can now see 23.65 printed in the console. The next thing I wanna talk about is what's known as conditional logic. So this is really where you start to get the power of programming. Basically the set of if statements you know, the conditions to actually make certain things happen, right? If you see this name, do this. If you see this result, do this. So how do you do that in Swift? Well, let's go ahead and start with an example using our new person. So let's do new person equal from the new person struct that we created earlier, open close parentheses with name, birth month, and age. So name, we will do Bob, birth month, January, and let's say Bob is 34. Now, what do we want to check? Well, we want to check what age Bob is going to be and kind of when his birthday is. So we can run a check if, starting with the if statement, new person dot birth month, and this is where we're going to do a comparison. So we use what's known as a comparison operator. There's a number of different ones that are available in Swift, but the first one we'll look at is equals equals. So this is basically saying if the left side of the equation is equal to the right side, then we'll execute something. So if new person dot birth month is equal to January, let's print out happy birthday, Bob, if it's January. So now when we run this, we can see we're actually getting something printed, happy birthday, Bob. If we were to change this, however, say it's January, we do February, and we run it again, now we're not getting anything printed. So that's the power of using conditions. We can actually say, if this condition is true, I want you to execute a piece, I want you to execute a piece of code, do some kind of functionality if this is true. What we can also do to kind of make this a little more functional is add an else condition onto our if statement. So you simply type else, open close brackets, and we'll print not your birthday, Bob. Now when we run this, what do you think is gonna happen? Are we gonna execute happy birthday, Bob, or are we gonna get not your birthday, Bob? Well, if we run it, we can see that we're getting not your birthday, Bob. That's because we're in February. So when the code runs, it goes through this statement. It looks at new person's birthday month, and it's checking to see, is the birth month January? It's not. We have it as February. So therefore, skip what's in here, and instead, execute the code that's in the else block.
in addition to that, we can also use something known as an else if. So if you have multiple conditions that you want to run, this is another way you can specify. So very simple, very similar to what we have before, we do an else if. And now we create a brand new if state. So we can say new person dot birth month equals February. Open and close curly braces. Print our happy birthday, Bob. Pretty cool, right? So now when we execute this, get this a little cleaner, and we actually run it, now you can see that we're getting not your birthday, Bob. Ah, it would help. <laughs> it would help if I actually spell things correctly. And that's one thing to be aware of. Strings can kind of catch you off guard if you don't spell things correctly. But there we go. Happy birthday, Bob. So now we're checking if Bob's birthday falls in January or his birthday falls in February. Now we're going to tell Bob happy birthday. Otherwise, it's not going to be his birthday. Now, I mentioned a little earlier about comparison operators. So things like the double equals. There are a number of different ones that we can use. So we have our double equals. We have our less than, greater than, less than or equal to, and greater than or equal to. So these are the ways that we're able to compare and actually execute code. So for another example, let's say let my number equals 100. If I want to check if another value is less than that, I can simply do if my number is less than 100, print below 100. Else, we're going to print above 100. All right. So now when we execute this, we can see we're above 100. Now, why is that? It's because 100 is not less than 100, right? So we can see we're going to skip this first part where it says my number is less than 100 and use the second output. Now instead, if we were to change this to something like a 10 and we run this again, now we can see that we're printing out below 100 because that's how the code is executing, that my number is less than 100, that is true, therefore, we're going to print out below 100. Another thing we can do with if statements is we can combine multiple things. So what do I mean by that? We can use multiple statements to actually confirm if we want to execute code. So for example, if new person dot birth month equals October, and this is the and operator to show that we want both conditions to be true. New person dot name is equal to Bob. Print happy birthday, Bob. So like I mentioned before, with this operator, we have to make sure that both conditions are true, that evaluate to true. So we have to have new person's birth month equal to October, and we have to have new person's name equal to Bob. So based on that, what do you think is going to happen? If we run this, you can see we're not printing anything, right? Because one of these is false. This is false new person dot birth month doesn't equal October. If you remember, new person is equal to February. Now, if we did want a way to make this evaluate to true, we can use the or operator, which is these two pipes. So what this statement is saying is we want to look at if new person birth month equals October is true, or if new person dot name is equal to Bob, then we'll print happy birthday, Bob. Now you can see we're printing out happy birthday, Bob. 
Another thing we can use instead of if statements is something known as a switch statement. So as you can see from the ifs, this can start to grow pretty large, right? You can imagine if we wanted to do an if statement for every single month of the year, this is gonna get pretty cluttered pretty fast. So what's another way that we can kind of make this a little cleaner? Well, that's by using something known as a switch. So first, we're gonna do something like create a my character, and this is gonna be of type character, another data type that Swift gives us access to, and we're just gonna make this J. Next, what we're gonna do is use the switch statement. So when you start typing, you can see, and you can autocomplete by hitting enter on a switch. And what this switch does is it shows you value, a case, which you're gonna have for a pattern, code to execute, if that pattern is met, and then the default. Default is kind of the catch-all. If you don't specify a case for it, it'll be handled by default. So what do we wanna switch on? We wanna switch on my character. So now we can look and see, okay, what is the pattern? Well, I wanna look at J. That's my first case. So if it's that, we can say, congrats, the character is J. Otherwise, in default, we can do print, that wasn't it. So now we can see when we run this that we have the congrats, the character is J because that's what we specified. We said we wanted our character to be J and we want to evaluate the different cases that my character could be. Now there are a ton of characters. We're not gonna go through and specify every single one, but just as another example, if you wanted to use case B, we could say print, Congrats, the character is B. So now we have two cases that we've specified that if my character is either J or B, we are gonna get one of these print statements. One set of code is gonna be evaluated. If we don't have either of those, we'll get the that wasn't it. So if you wanna test that, simply change this to just any different letter. And if we run it again, you can see, yep, that wasn't it. That's not what got printed. The next thing I wanna to touch on is enumerations. So enumerations are a way for you to group together similar cases, similar things. So in our case, we're gonna do something called, and you'll learn more about this later if you keep following my channel, um, HTTP methods. So if that doesn't mean anything to you, that's totally fine, don't worry about it. This is, gonna make more sense later in the future. But we have a few different cases that we can make. We start by declaring our enum HTTP method with the enum keyword, open and curly, open curly brace and close curly brace, and then we start specifying cases. So we have case get, case put, case post, and case delete. Again, if that doesn't mean anything to you at the moment, don't worry, we'll touch on it in a future video. Now, another way you can declare enums is if they are all of the same type, you can actually do this whole thing on a single line. So instead of putting case get, case put, case post, case delete, we can actually get rid of this and just separate with commas. So put, post, delete, and it'll do the exact same thing. So if we wanted to see the different values and access it, we can print out HTTP method dot syntax, and we now have access to all the cases we created. So if we print this out, you can see what we got back was post. Now, another thing you can do with enums is you can actually specify the underlying type of what the cases are. So if we use an example, the seasons, so enum seasons, we're gonna make this have a string type associated to it. So we can go through the different ones, case summer, case spring, case winter, case fall. And now Xcode's gonna get mad for a second, but we're actually gonna specify strings for each of these. 
and we're going to use some emojis. So the way you can access that on your keyboard, kind of a quick way, is if you do Control Command Spacebar. When you click on that, you get the emoji keyboard. And we can just search for different things. So I'll do sun. Pick that one. Kind of like it. Um, spring, we'll do like a flower. So we can use that flower here. Winter. I kind of like the snowman with the flurry. And then fall, we'll look for a leaf. A leaf, excuse me. So here we have our seasons with an underlying type of string. So what can we do with that? We can actually print this out. And we can see if we look at fall and we print it out, it's going to print out fall. So it's taking this value here and actually printing it out to the console. But what if we actually wanted to return our leaf emoji? Well, now we can use what's known as the raw value. So seasons.fall.raw value. And this is the value that we actually specified being of type string. So when we print this out, you can see that this is in quotation marks, giving you an indication it's a string, and we actually see the leaf. How cool is that? Now, I know we've gone over a lot, but the final thing I want to show you is how we can use loops. Loops are a way to execute a certain piece of code many times without having to repeat it over and over and over. So how do we do that? Well, first, let's set up what's known as an array. An array is a collection of similar data. So we're going to use our recently created enum seasons. So we'll call it let seasons, and it'll be of type seasons that we put inside these brackets. These brackets are how you indicate that you want to create an array. And we're going to specify all the values we want. I'm going to change this to favorite seasons. So these will be my favorite seasons. And we can now use dot syntax, since we already specified that favorite seasons is going to be of type array of seasons, we now know, or the compiler knows, that it can use the different cases from enums. So I don't know. I like fall. Falls nice and winter. So then I close the bracket, and now this is my favorite seasons. If we print this out, we can see we're getting two things seasons.fall, don't worry about these, and seasons.winter. Okay? Now, what do we want to do with that in the loop? Well, we're just going to loop through each item in our array and just print out the raw value. So get the emoji, basically, uh, like we did before. But instead of having to write it multiple times, we just have to use one for loop. So we create a for loop by specifying for. And now we give it a name, anything we want. Uh, but try to use things that make sense in the context of what you're working on. So for example, if we're looping through a seasons array, let's call it season right? Then we use in. And now what are we actually going to loop through? We called it favorite seasons. Now we do an open and close curly brace. And we're going to do basically exactly what we did here. We're going to print out season dot raw value. So notice when I click on this, we're accessing our season. So this code is going to execute for every object that is in this favorite seasons, it will execute this piece of code. So if we run this, we can see that it ran two times because we have two things specified in the array. And look what got printed. We have our leaf and we have our snowman. Now if we change this, say we add summer and we run it again, now we get three printed out. So for every item that gets added to this array, the loop will execute one more time. 
So let's take a look, everybody. I mean, look at everything you did. I know we went over a lot. Like, you've gone through, if you stuck with me the whole video, you've coded up 140-some lines of Swift code. That's awesome. So, that's really it. Uh, look at everything that we've done. It's great progress so far. So, I know this was a lot. There was a bunch to go over. Don't feel bad if it doesn't all stick immediately. Remember, coding is not easy. It is difficult. It takes a lot of time, a lot of repetition, but the key is to just keep doing it. Keep practicing each day, working on little things. So hopefully you were able to stick with me. If you liked the video, please give it a like and consider subscribing so that you won't miss when I make any new uploads. But thanks everybody. I'll catch you in the next one.